Welcome to Public Finance in Canada. I am Keith Kucha, and I will be leading you through this uh, through this exciting topic as we move forward through the rest of the semester. Our game plan for today, let's see uh, what exactly we're going to be taking a look at in this video. We're going to start off by taking a look at, okay, what is public finance? We're going to define that. We're going to take a look at some of the basic underlying as to how we're going to assess this topic and what's going on there. Uh, from there, we're going to kind of carry on to some of the big ideas of the course. Now, of course, we're not going to get into them. That's what the rest of the semester is for. But we're going to introduce the ideas and give you a, a kind of a heads up as to where we're going. Uh, from there, we're going to go on. We're going to define some of the legal frameworks of government. Now, okay, this stuff can get kind of boring, but it's going to be relevant to what we go on to next as to what certain levels of government can and cannot do. So that's where we're going to go after that point there. Bunch of the legal statutes, bunch of the stuff going on, bunch of the differentiations between federal, provincial, and municipal levels of government. So without further ado, let's start off and let's take a look at our first little topic there, which is intro into public finance and what exactly we mean by public finance. So let's jump over and let's take a look at that. Okay, so ultimately, public finance is just the study of the role of the government in the economy. So that's pretty important. Let's write that down. That is the, you can forgive my chicken scratch, you're going to have to deal with it all semester, a uh, study of the role of the government. I uh, will abbreviate that to G-O-V apostrophe T. I uh, get used to that. That's how we'll uh, abbreviate uh, government throughout the whole semester. Study of the role of the government in the economy. Okay, so we're going to be taking a look at right how the government actually interacts with the free market, with the economy on whole. And a lot of that is going to be really getting at, well, the role of the government. What role should they take? What should their uh, position be in that? Uh, specifically, what we're going to assess with this is, of course, we're going to look at the role of taxation. So I'm just going to go taxes. What are the role of taxes? How much taxes should we collect? What the, should those taxes be used for? How should we collect taxes? I uh, will also take a look at uh, expenditure. That's the flip side, of course. That is, where should the government be expending their resources to? What should they be spending their money on? What programs, what services, uh, what should the government be providing to us all together? So two of the big things that we're going to be taking a look at. Um, and ultimately with that is how do we adjust one eh, versus the other in order to reach the desirable outcomes that we want as a society? And how do we use them to avoid undesirable outcomes? So Ultimately, taxation and expenditure is kind of two flip sides of the same coin. Of course, we do have borrowing in there as well. We could borrow money to uh, finance our expenditure. But if we borrow money, ultimately that has to come back and be paid for via taxes. So taxes and expenditure really being the big part there. Carrying on from this, one of the big things to kind of clear up right at the start is that really public finance, this analysis of public finance, it is a subsection of economics. So being a subsection of under economics, it's going to have the following underlying assumptions that you'll see throughout the entire course. Uh, these underlying assumptions are going to be that we live in a world of scarcity. And okay, what does that mean that we live in a world of scarcity? Ah, that just means that we have limited resources. There's only so much stuff, so much time, so much money, so much raw resources, logs, that's our forests, natural resources, etc., etc., etc. On its own, that wouldn't be that big of a problem, except we would say that you and I, humans, we have near unlimited wants. So okay, that's the problem there. Limited resources, near or unlimited wants, uh, we have a bit of a problem there. We want to do everything, but we only have 24 hours in a day. Oh no. Well, because we have scarcity, what that ultimately is going to mean is that we now need to make choices. And this is important. This is something when I talk to a lot of people about public finance, about government, about government expenditure that we kind of forget about is that if we decide to fund this project, that's money we have to devote to that project. That's money that cannot now be used for something else. So because we live in a world of scarcity, we have these choices that we need to make. We need to choose between program A and program B. 
Okay. Attached to this, one of the big fundamental things with economics is because we make choices, these choices mean that we then face opportunity costs. Uh, opportunity costs. And let's talk about what this opportunity cost is. Most people have a decent understanding as to an opportunity cost, but just to make sure everyone's on the right page, um, essentially what the opportunity cost is, is that next best alternative that you gave up. And, okay, we could think about this in the public finance world such that, hey, if we decided to fund program A at the expense of program B, that is, we gave up program B, well, then the opportunity cost of program A was program B. Uh, to put it into a bit of a different context, let's suppose that I were to offer you a, I'm not going to go too detailed with it, but I'm going to offer you a coffee crisp. So there we go, yellow packaging for a coffee crisp chocolate bar. Now, just for free, come on up, get your Coffee Crisp chocolate bar, and okay, you come up, you get it, and I say, okay, hey, what was your cost of getting that Coffee Crisp? Well, in this case, pretty much nothing. You have had almost no cost in getting that Coffee Crisp. Sure, if we were in an in-class setting or however it was, you had to physically come and get that Coffee Crisp, but you gave up very little. We would say that, you know, your cost was negligible in that point there. Okay, now the interesting thing happens. If I give you choices, I actually start to increase your cost. So let's say now that I say, hey, come on up. You can pick either a Coffee Crisp or you can pick a Kit Kat. Your choice there, come on up, make your choice. Now, of course, right, of course you come up and you pick the Coffee Crisp. Well, let's keep our colors consistent there. You come up and you pick the Coffee Crisp. But hey, in this scenario here, you still pick the same chocolate bar. But now, because I've given you a choice between the two, I've now also provided you with a cost. That is, now, if you pick this Coffee Crisp, by doing so, you are going to be giving up that Kit Kat. That's now something that you could have had and you no longer do. So the more choices I give you, the more choices you have available to you, and you can only pick one, well, that's going to make a higher and higher cost of choosing what you have. Uh, keep in mind with that, right? If you are really, you really enjoy both. You really enjoy Coffee Crisps. You really enjoy Kit Kats and you're kind of torn between the two. Well, in that case there, the reason you're really torn between the two is because your opportunity cost of picking one over the other is really high. That is, you get almost the same level of value from both of them. And right, maybe you value that Coffee Crisp just a little bit more. So you end up choosing the Coffee Crisp but that's at a large cost of giving up the Kit Kat. And so your net benefit or your net value of choosing that Coffee Crisp is going to be smaller as a result. Uh, from that, we can take away, right, the more choices I give you, more likely more of those choices are going to be very close to each other. So the more choices I provide to you, the higher the opportunity cost of whichever one you end up choosing. So just a little bit of a foray into the basics of economics there. Really what we're taking away from this, and this is going to be the underlying assumption, the underlying kind of thread throughout this whole course, is we live in a world of scarcity. Scarcity forces us to make choices, and choices carry with them opportunity costs. That being said, let's carry on. Let's take a look at what we're going to be looking at over the course of the semester. So our plan. Oh, let's go back to using white. Okay, our plan. What's our plan? Uh, first, we're going to evaluate the role of government within the economy. So, role of the government. Right? This is going to be a lot of normative statements. This is going to be a lot of what government ought to do, what they should do, a lot of opinion-based statements. And we'll take a look at these from many different stands, uh, many different points of view. And really with this, this is area of discussion. This is why we have various political parties, different various political stances, is because there's no really agreed upon role of government as to what they should or shouldn't do. Uh, with this, we'll take a look at some cases as to when the government should or shouldn't get involved in the marketplace. We'll take a look at some uh, metrics as to how to decide whether or not the government should intervene. And of course, we'll with that as well say, okay, what if we have competing projects? What if we have both Kit Kats and Coffee Crisps? How do we pick one project over the other? And we'll take a look at some decision rules to figure that out.
Uh, what we're also going to be taking a look at is we're going to take a look at different responsibilities. Responsibilities of government. And with this, really what we could say is responsibilities of different levels of government. So what are the responsibilities of the federal government, the provincial government, and local, regional, municipal governments? Uh, with that, we'll take a look at budgeting, reporting requirements, and all of that at our diff uh, the different levels. Very exciting stuff, of course. Carrying on. Uh, after we get through all the budgets and responsibilities and all of that great stuff, we're then going to be taking a look at sources of revenue. Sources of revenue. So this is going to be our taxation side. Where does government revenue come from? Where does the government get access to its funds in order to spend it? And this is different, of course, depending on the level of government you're considering. Different if we're talking about the federal versus provincial versus municipal. Often it's the legal framework that uh, separates between those guys. After we talk about our sources of revenue, the next one on the line is going to be sources. Um, I guess I shouldn't say sources. Let's go and change that. We're going to say major projects or rather major expenditures. We're going to be looking at some of the big areas where governments end up spending money. And as we're looking at public finance in Canada, we're going to be looking at some of the major sources of expenditure as it applies to public finance in Canada. So as it applies to Canadian governments. So that's uh, that's going to be pretty close to our end of our semester as we get to that. If we have time, which uh, we probably will get a chance to take a look at it a little bit, we're going to be taking a look at some uh, special topics in public finance, some current events, and uh, especially with that, we'll take a look at income distribution. Income distribution. I'm just going to abbreviate distribution to just, I don't know, exponent N there. Income distribution and inequality. So pretty hot topic right now. It's popping up all over the place. Hey, we're world becoming an increasingly an unequal world, not just with any one country, but across countries as well. What is or what ought to be the role of government in that? Of course, anytime we get into those statements of what ought to be or what should be, typically those are normative or opinion-based statements. And as a result, we will open those up to discussion and we'll take a look at some of the information and recognize that there's going to be different views depending on different life stages, upbringings, experiences, values, etc., etc. So that's our plan for the semester. To start off, we'll be taking a look at this role of government, of course. Next week, we will start to get into what should the government do be doing in our economy, cases to intervene, cases not to intervene, and then weekly, we'll kind of continue on through there. Budgets, revenue sources, expenditure sources, and then wrapping up with our income distribution and inequality, if, if we have the time for that. Okay, so let's start off by taking a look at some of the legal framework. And this is, right, this is, a bunch of this stuff is going to be rather boring, rather tedious. My apologies in that. Uh, still important to get through, still some relevant parts in that to be able to differentiate what we can or cannot do. Uh, before we get to this is really taking a look at why this legal framework is important. And really, it's going to be kind of the fundamental minimum role of government as we would view it from kind of an economic standpoint. And that is at minimum kind of our role of government to exist in order to be able to allow functioning markets to exist is we would want to see a government that is able to maintain a monopoly of violence. And this kind of sounds scary, like, oh, the government having a monopoly of violence? And yeah, it can be scary. Um, we'll see. We'll put on some kind of controlling characteristics farther on that make this a bit better. But the idea behind this is that if you have, within a certain area, many different groups or actors who are able to utilize violence to achieve their means, 
it's very difficult to have a functioning economy. It's very difficult to have functioning markets or to have functioning society. Because, hey, in the end of the day, if you get something nice, but somebody over in that other group also thinks it's nice and wants it, there's nothing stopping them from getting a big stick and taking it from you. If the government is able to maintain that monopoly of violence, saying, hey, guys, we are the only ones allowed to use physical force as a form of control, then, well, we have a lot more control, we have a lot more order, we have peace and good government. So a monopoly of violence is kind of the first kind of thing we would need a government to be able to exercise. From a monopoly of violence, what we would ideally want is kind of a tag along is a rule of law. So with the rule of law, this really outlines what the government can and cannot do with their monopoly of violence. What are their uh, boundaries, as it were? And also for you as a citizen of this country, of this economy, to know, hey, what can I do or not do? When am I going to get in trouble versus when am I not going to get in trouble? Having a clear understanding of this rule of law really allows us to understand the rules of the game. And understanding the rules of the game allow us to play the game to win. Imagine, right, in that kind of analogy, playing Monopoly and having no idea how to play Monopoly. No one's told you the rules. You're just going through trying to figure it out as you go. It's going to be pretty difficult. You're going to be getting in trouble from the other players because they're like, hey, you can't do that. Or what are you doing? You're not supposed to. It's going to be very difficult to be successful. If you understand the laws, if you understand the rules, well, now you know how to utilize those laws, utilize those rules in order for you to be successful, in order to win at the game. Okay, kind of a subcategory of this rule of law and a rather important one is going to be property rights. And these property rights as enshrined in law, this A, prevents the government or some other actor coming along with their big stick and taking things away from you that you own because, hey, you have that legal right, that legal entitlement to that good. Uh, what property rights also allow us to know is what we are and what we are not allowed to own, what we are and what we are not allowed to buy and sell. Certain things are going to be outlined as illegal. Right? You are not allowed to own certain things. Well, you are allowed to own other things. And I'm sure you can all go through and think about circumstances as to what you can and cannot buy, what you can and cannot own. So property rights, outlining that. Again, just kind of putting through the rules of the game. Outside of this, right? this is kind of going to be our idea of a bare minimum of government. Everything beyond this we'd kind of see as gravy, just extra bonus stuff that is either going to help or maybe not help an economy on whole. Uh, with that, kind of the great uh, question and something we will be evaluating throughout the whole semester is really what else? That is, what else should the government do? Beyond this, beyond just setting the laws, determining what we can and cannot own and maintaining their monopoly of violence, what other role do we have for government? Now, of course, this is going to vary based off of each person as to what they should be. Should they be encouraging economic efficiency? Should they be encouraging some kind of level of social fairness? Um, the list could go on and on and on. And as we go through, of course, we will evaluate this and we will build on to it. But definitely something to kind of take a pause and think about is from your perspective, what else should the government be doing? What else should the role of government be? Okay, so as we're taking a look at the legal framework still, we're still underneath this whole bit where the government should have the rule of law. And underneath the rule of law, what we have is we have the Constitution. So back to the 1867 BNA Act. Let's write that down. 1867 British North America Act. This is where we've got our first kind of constitution. Uh, it was followed up in good old 1982 with our actual Constitution Act. Constitution Act, where we were actually able to bring the Constitution home and have it here on Canadian soil. So, okay, why is, why is this important? Well, because this Constitution, this is, gives us the authority as to what provinces can do, what the federal government can do, what regional governments can do, and what rights these governments have, what rights we as citizens of Canada have. So, 
This sets out the rules of the game. Importantly, from our perspective, is it sets out rules for taxation. Right, we're looking at public finance. So hey, how can governments raise funds? Outlined in the Constitution Act is rules for taxation. Which levels of government can raise taxes from where and how? Similarly, it also outlines the rules for expenditure. How much money or what money can federal government versus provincial government versus local government spend? Uh, for example, can the federal government expend money on health care? Or is that a provincial responsibility or is that a municipal responsibility? What about national defense? Is that federal, provincial, or municipal? Right? Constitution Act sets out these rules, sets out those authorities and the boundaries to say, hey, federal government, you stay over in your lane. Provincial governments, you stay over in your lane. Uh, with that, we're also going to have a bit of an importance here as we take a look at taxation is we really have two different types of taxation. We have direct taxation and we have indirect taxation. Okay, so what's the distinction between the two? Direct taxes, uh, these are levied on typically income and activities conducted. So in this case here, it's direct. You pay the tax directly. You can't really pass this tax on to somebody else. So we would say, right, it's direct taxes paid directly by the person concerned with it. So that's really the big thing with that. And you can't pass it on. Um, in this case, we would say that direct taxation, this can be actually rather difficult. Uh, this can be things like income taxes, wealth taxes, these kind of situations. And they're difficult to really administer because, I mean, we need the entire CRA, the Canadian Revenue Agency, in order to administer and figure out everything to do with the taxation side of things. We need, for example, here in uh, British Columbia, we need BC assessment to be able to assess the value of every property in the province in order to figure out the wealth tax on that property. That is your property tax. So a lot of administration needs to go into the valuing, the determining of how much each individual has to be able to then collect and figure out what everybody needs to pay for taxes. Indirect taxes, well, these are indirect as it's typically not the government collecting these directly. It's rather being directed by an agent of the government, or sorry, collected by an agent of the government. And in this case here, these are typically taxes on goods and services. So in that case there, sure, I might pay the tax, but if I then sell that good, well, I get to recover that tax by selling it to somebody else. Right, And I can sell it by the price I paid plus the tax. And so I'm able to not necessarily always face that tax. I can sometimes pass it on to others. In this case here, this tax is relatively easy. It's relatively easy to collect. Because, hey, we already know the value of a chocolate bar. When you go to buy a chocolate bar, we put that value right there at the thing. We're like, hey, it's $1.50 for a chocolate bar. Oh, sorry, you got to pay 10% of that as a tax. So some examples of indirect taxes, this is going to be our GST or PST. Actually, we're going to come back to that. Interestingly enough, in Canada, not our GST, PST. That's kind of a legal uh, loophole that got created. Um, but we'll also see that as kind of our customs duties. So anytime we have a tariff or anything like that, good or service comes across the border and we have to pay something extra for that, uh, we'll see that, that there is an indirect tax. And those are relatively easier to maintain, easier to uh, figure out and to collect taxes on. Let's go take a look at this Constitution Act. Let's go break this down by our level of government and take a look at what are the rules, the authorities, and what each level of government has control or ability over. Okay, so starting off with our federal government, the highest level of government here in Canada. So this is all of our federal ministers, the prime minister, his cabinet, all sitting in Ottawa. So federal government, going back to the Constitution Act of 1867, uh, it gives the federal government the power to make laws for the peace, order, and good government of Canada. So 
That's just laws for peace, order, and good government. So essentially, right, be able to do what they can do in order to meet these objectives, in order to maintain the peace, maintain order, and to exercise good governance. This includes the ability for the federal government to raise money through any means of taxation. So the government of Canada, the federal government, can raise money in any mode they deem fit, and they can go about in really any way. They have that power exercised to them through our Constitution Act. Uh, the only real exceptions, there are a few that are put in there. One of the big ones that we will uh, well mention now and then not really talk about too much again as we go on is that there is a section there that prevents the federal government from taxing provincial lands. So any lands that are owned by the province, provincial buildings, etc. like that, federal government can't touch those, cannot levy taxes on provincial land. Okay, some history with this. Pre-Confederation, so that is pre-1867, about 99% of government revenues, so that's all of our tax revenues, I came from indirect taxes, right? Keep in mind, we said these were the easier ones to collect. So this is going to be sales taxes, but primarily customs duties. So every time we imported things from the U.S., anytime we imported things from Britain, France, the world out there on whole, well, the government had an import duty on that, had an impact, import tax on it, and collected some money from the shippers before it even was allowed onto Canadian soil. So pre-Confederation, pretty much our entire budget was financed through these customs duties. Post-Confederation, uh, post-Confederation, only the federal government was permitted to utilize indirect taxes. Um, that is, the founders, right, they saw at that time there that indirect taxes were really powerful. They were really, at that time, the only tax utilized. And so they pictured a really strong federal government that was able to have a lot of taxation powers, responsibilities, and authority. Um, with all that authority, right, going back to Spider-Man, with with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, the responsibilities of the government with all of this ability to collect taxes was to provide, well, things like national defense. This is why we only have a federal military, right? The, uh, the Canadian Armed Forces. We don't here in Canada have our provincial forces, right? If you want to compare and contrast that with the US, in the U.S., each state has their own National Guard. The National Guard is essentially the state's military. Now, okay, technically in that case there, they have pledged themselves to the president and to the uh, federal government of the U.S., but we don't have that same distinction here in Canada. In Canada, only the federal government is responsible for national defense. Provinces, provinces do not have that authority or that responsibility. Federal government also has the responsibility for navigation and shipping. Uh, navigation and shipping. Uh, what else? What else? There's some big things here. There are some big things. Trade, commerce. So they have the kind of authority over trade. So this would be international trade and also within the country itself, interprovincial trade. Uh, we'll go trade slash commerce. So overseeing the business aspects of the economy of the country on whole. And of course, the criminal justice system. That is, Government Canada gets to decide what is a criminal offense versus what is a civil offense. So criminal justice is taken care of by the federal government. Going on beyond this is going to be the next big one would be the money and banking system. Money and banking being taken care of. It looks like I said banking. That uh, should be an N there. There we go. Money and banking. This is the role of the federal government to be able to print money and provide money from the federal perspective. Uh, keep in mind, in Canada, this wasn't always the case. Uh, Pre-Confederation, 
every bank, and actually this continued for a while after Confederation even, every bank printed its own currency. You would have money being printed by the Bank of Montreal. You would have money being printed by the Bank of Nova Scotia and all the other banks that existed at that time. How do you figure out, well, okay, what's this dollar from Bank of Nova Scotia worth for a dollar of uh, Bank of Montreal? Uh, that I'd be figured out based off of what people's kind of uh, opinions were of those banks. Did they think that money was sound or did they think that money was kind of sketchy? And so informal exchange rates ended up existing. With the adoption of, hey, the federal government had the authority, the responsibility to maintain the money supply and to print the money, well, we then had the adoption of a national currency. And we see the rise of the Canadian dollar. So just to kind of overline some of the responsibilities of the federal government. Uh, what's the difference? What do uh, the provinces have? And, right, we're talking about the federal government, but we're in the Constitution Act, and uh, really the Constitution Act also outlines what is going to be the role of the provinces. So let's take a look at that. Provinces. I'm just going to abbreviate that as provinces. And of course, we're not going to be taking a look at the entire responsibilities of the province, just like we didn't take a look at the entire responsibilities of the federal government. But the provinces are responsible for general government. General government. So the general governance of their province, of their area, of what's going on there. The provinces are also responsible for delivering justice. So the justice system in each province. Now keep in mind, the federal government is responsible for criminal justice, but the provinces for all other levels of justice. Uh, also, the provinces, this is a provincial responsibility, is going to be education. So the education system, each province is responsible for education, which is, of course, why we have quite, I wouldn't say quite varying, but varying education and standards of education as we go from province to province. We would also have welfare. So welfare of the people within that province, that is, on, that is on the provincial government. That is up to them. And finally, internal transport. So highways, bridges, infrastructure, all of that, internal transport, that is on the provinces. That's what they were left to deal with. Um, one of the big parts right underneath welfare, underneath welfare, we have that nowadays. Sure, we have many welfare systems that exist in each of the province, but also we could attach onto that is healthcare. Healthcare being a big part there. Okay. From that, seems like, okay, here we have a whole bunch of things that the federal government can do. Here we have a bunch of things that the provinces can do. Uh, problem is, is that the provinces need to pay for all of these things. But going back to 1867, going back to our Constitution Act, uh, they said that, hey, only the federal government could levy indirect taxes. That is, the provinces were not allowed to. The provinces, they only had direct taxes available to them. And right at that time, direct taxes were extremely difficult to levy, extremely difficult to figure out, extremely difficult to figure out even what to do with them. Um, income tax really didn't exist at this point. So again, going back, the founders wanted to put all the power at the federal level. And so what ended up happening through time is... The courts ended up looking at this and they ended up taking a look at it and they defined, oddly enough, uh, I should write that properly, PST, provincial sales tax, they define that actually as a direct tax. And that is because typically speaking in their minds at least is that most of these things being purchased are consumption goods. And that is if you are buying it to consume, that is if you buy a donut to consume or buy a donut to eat, well, you can't pass along that tax to anybody else, right? Now, okay, if you bought that donut to sell to somebody else and then that other person then consumes it, sure, you pass it along in that way, but then it ends up being paid by the end user. So a little bit, I think, of uh, legal flexibility needs to be taken into mind there, but it was decided that, hey, provincial governments, uh, we're going to kind of put a little bit of a tweak on our definitions of direct and indirect taxes. 
and we're going to define PST as a direct tax. So opening up the provinces to a bit of a larger income source. Unfortunately, that still wasn't enough. Uh, as we see, especially with areas such as education and healthcare, these become massive, massive budget drains to the provincial governments, and often they don't, they don't really have the resources, the funds available to pay for it. So in 1912, oh, in 1912, there we go, or rather starting in 1912, the federal government began to extend its powers into the provincial territory, right? So it kind of started to overcome this kind of initial divide in the Constitution Act. And the federal government was like, okay, hey, hey, we're going to kind of take our tendrils and we're going to get in here and we're going to help with education. Uh, we're going to get in here and we're going to help with health care. And the way this was done was it was done through, un, or sorry, not unconditional, through conditional grants. And that is essentially the federal government. They had all of this money because they had access to both direct and indirect taxes. So they had all of this money and they said to the provinces, hey, we're willing to grant you a bunch of money, but it has strings attached. We have conditions attached to it. And these conditions are, you must put this towards agricultural education. You must put it towards employment services, highway construction, technical education, disease prevention, wealth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So even though officially it's the provincial jurisdiction to provide education, federal government kind of made their way in there by saying, we'll give you money only if. Healthcare, provincial regulation, provincial authority, Federal government made its way in there with the strings attached. Okay, most of the provinces, right, it was deemed that, hey, this is okay because the provinces could always say no, right? Provinces can always choose to opt out and say, no, nope, this is violating our authority. This is violating our right as a province to deal with that ourselves. Um, we can say no. We can choose to reject the money. Uh, Quebec, right? Historically, Quebec has done that, said, hey, this is a violation of our sovereignty as a province. Back off, federal government, we have this. But most of the other provinces have tended to accept the money and accepted that money with the strings attached. That's our overview of the federal government. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the provincial. Okay, so as we already mentioned, the Constitution Act of 1867 it only gave the provinces ability to engage in direct taxation. So again, direct taxation being income taxes, wealth taxes. And neither one of these really existed at the time. So we saw that, hey, over time, kind of oddly enough, the courts ruled that these value-added taxes like PST were considered a direct tax. And so as a whole, provinces were able to start to put in PSTs. Um, it also was, we witnessed over the last uh, century-ish, is the addition that, hey, provinces also have the right over to setting their natural resource royalties. For some provinces that turned out to be very rich in natural resources, this turned out to be huge for them. Uh, looking at Alberta, for example, there. So setting the price of their natural resource royalties also provided the provinces with lots more revenue. And this began to change kind of the power dynamics between the provinces and the federal government. That is, on whole, the role of the provinces has increased since Confederation, while the role of the federal government has only decreased. Yes, the federal government still is getting its tendrils in everywhere, but the provinces have been pushing for more and more and more. Uh, one of the other big things in our whole 1867 Constitution Act is the provincial regulation of trade. And that is provinces are not given the power to inhibit interprovincial trade through the use of taxes or subsidies. That is, there's they cannot go and say, hey, hey, sorry, Alberta, we're not going to allow that to come across the border unless we collect an import duty first. Right? We're saying, no, there has to be free movement of goods and services between the provinces. Um, we are not allowed to inhibit this interprovincial trade through taxation. So one of the big things that shows up there. 
Uh, outside of that, there's not a ton to talk about with the provincial government that we haven't already kind of jumped the gun and talked about back over there. So let's move on and talk about our local governments. This is our third layer of government here in Canada. And our local government, this is both regional governments or municipalities. And really the Constitution Act, it doesn't talk about local governments, right? So we go back to the 1867 Constitution Act and it doesn't really mention them. It leaves it out. So really, there's no constitutional power for local governments. These local governments only have the power which is delegated to them by the provinces. So as a result, it goes from the province, they get to decide what is the authorities, what is the rules, what can and cannot these local governments do. So really, these local governments are just serving underneath the laws made at the provincial level. As a result of this, while of course what different municipalities and regions can do is going to vary quite widely as we move from province to province. In order to kind of scale this into more reasonable kind of focus, what we're going to be taking a look at of course is the province of British Columbia because that's where we are. And then in the province of British Columbia, what we're going to take a look at is two forms of local government. And these two forms are municipalities, so municipal and, uh, sorry, municipal and regional. So the two different ways that we have broken up local governance. So municipalities, well, altogether we have 162 municipalities here in the province. Uh, these municipalities are your cities, your towns, your villages, the incorporated regions that are really kind of becoming our metro centers. Uh, the regional districts, there's 27 of them all together. These regional districts, these include the rural areas outside of the municipalities. So for example, here on the South Island, we're part of the capital regional district. This capital regional district uh, really encompasses most of the South Island goes all the way up to Souk and includes some of the Gulf Islands, up to Sydney, and all the rural area in between. Uh, as you go up over the Malahat, you then begin to go into the Cowichan Valley Regional District as you continue north the Nanaimo Regional District, on and on and on. Uh, these regional areas, they really just kind of encompass the municipalities and the rural areas attached. Not much more to say about local governments at this point. We will kind of start talking about the uh, authorities and the rules placed on them as we go through. Um, really what we can say is that in uh, BC here at least, the only real way that these uh, local governments can collect taxation revenue is through wealth taxes. And in that case, they're primarily our property tax. And we see that in every year property tax is being assessed and figuring out okay what you have to pay based off the value of your residence or if you have a business the value of the land of your business and that money goes towards that regional or that local government for the provision of goods and services that does us for our overview of the legal framework let's go and carry on and next we'll take a look at a bit more of the fluffy side of things and we'll be taking a look at size of government. What should the right size of government be? Or rather, how do we even measure size of government? What do we mean when we say that? From size of government, we'll look into some of the problems in measuring that. And we'll then take a look at roles of government and what those roles should be. If you have any questions about any of the things we've talked about with our legal frameworks, with our introduction to public finance, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, please feel free to email, post in the comments below, or leave a comment on the Frequently Asked Questions page on D2L. In the next video, we will jump and take a look at the size and the role of government.